we're making our way through the chronology of the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. We've covered Oswald's childhood, his time in the Marines, his time in the Soviet Union, his return to Dallas, and most recently, his New Orleans era in the summer of 1963. We still have Mexico City and Oswald's remaining time in Dallas to cover before we finish this season two of Solving JFK. As for this episode, we've just wrapped up our seven-part series on Oswald in New Orleans, and in this 10th edition of Recap and Rebuttals, we'll be talking Riley Coffee Company, Judith Berry Baker, the ties between Oswald and Guy Bannister, Oswald's Fair Play for Cuba committee work, his arrest in New Orleans, and then the subsequent media blitz there. And today, we today's a good one. We are joined by author, screenwriter, and researcher James D. Eugenio. Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. We are joined today by author James D. Eugenio. Jim wrote Destiny Betrayed, Reclaiming Parkland, the JFK Assassination, and the JFK Assassination Chokeholds, for which I also contributed. He also wrote the screenplay for Oliver Stone's 2022 documentary, JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. Jim, thanks for joining us. It's great to finally get you on Solving JFK. Did I leave out any of your uh, any of your projects you worked on? No. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> all right. All right. But that's good, a good. that's a good summary. Okay. Good. Good. And uh, in in one of the episodes, I actually recommended your book Destiny Betrayed as sort of a a great resource uh, for New Orleans and the Garrison case and and all things related to the summer of 1963. There. Uh, and I know that you know a ton about, about this subject in, in a lot of different areas, so looking forward to picking your brain on these topics. Kind of like when we drove from uh, Cincinnati to Pittsburgh, and I just like <laughs> constantly, I was like, what about Madeline Brown? What about Madeline Brown? You know, so this will be like that, except for I'll, I'll have notes, so, so okay. this will be good. All right. Um, before we get started, so usually this is recap and rebuttals. I didn't have many rebuttals. I, I tried to really cover all the counterpoints in in the uh, episodes, so I hadn't actually no additional rebuttals. But uh, I had a few people correct me on pronunciations. I just want to I just want to state for the record, it's not Huma, it's Homa, Louisiana. It's not Schlumberger, it's Schlumber Schlumberger. Right. It's it's not Michoud, it's Michou. And it's not William Gaudet, it's William Gaudet. Okay, right. uh, I, I'm wrong about those, and uh, there, there's the, the rebuttal corrections. Before we get started, why did Oswald go to New Orleans? All right, it's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Because if you're a Warren Commission zealot, you say that it was big due to the Walker shooting. Okay, but if you're someone like me who believes Oswald didn't have anything to do, you know, with the with the Walker shooting, then that creates a problem because also, of course, I'm sure you're aware, for seven and a half months, Oswald was never a suspect in the uh, in the in the Walker shooting. It was only after the Kennedy assassination that he becomes a suspect. All right, and in fact, he becomes a guilty party supposedly. All right, now I believe. If you analyze the evidence, I believe Oswald is sent to New Orleans um, because both the FBI and the CIA have a anti-fair play for Cuba committee crusades. Both of them do. All right. David Phillips uh, and Jim McCord 
uh, are part of it, okay, at the beginning. And then Gelanides is a part of it later. And, and the Alan Kent is also out of JM Wave. Um, Carta Deloach is running the Anti-Fair Play for Cuba Committee as the FBI guy, all right? So if you, if, if, if you factor that into the equation and then you run down Oswald's very strange activities there in the fall, the summer, and, and, and the uh, spring of 1963, I believe that's the reason that Oswald was sent to New Orleans in 1963. Yeah, I mean, aside from uh, the Walker thing that you mentioned, the only other po like possible explanation I've heard anyone say is uh, he was looking for work in New Orleans, as if he couldn't get work in, in <laughs> Dallas Fort Worth area. You know what I mean? So Dallas Fort Worth is a bigger metropolitan area than New Orleans was. You know, yeah. so right. So so yeah. So the, I agree that that is not um, <laughs> by by no means is there like a reasonable. Uh, uh, articulated purpose for him to go to new orleans outside of some sort of uh you know him being told uh mm -hmm. to go there which will we'll, we'll, that's really sort of the central question we'll dig into but so the the first thing is riley coffee company so oswald goes to new orleans gets this job at riley coffee company and william riley he's the owner he he donated to the crusade to free cuba committee which was led by sergio arcacha smith uh and who's cia connected uh, cuban exile and uh and he also donated to inca the information council of the americas now, now, now that's that's really important the, yeah. the, the inca thing mm -hmm. because butler is the guy running inca for oxner okay and as we're going to see later butler is the guy <laughs> Oswald debates, you know, with Stucky, okay, at the whole end of this, you know, very weird uh, excursion that Oswald has into the streets of New Orleans. And it's during this debate that Oswald gets exposed as a defector to the Soviet Union. And he, he slips up during the debate. I'm sure you're aware, okay, on the original tape, it says... Uh, I was under the, I mean, I was not under the protection of the State Department, okay? <laughs> okay, so yeah. that's a very interesting association. At the beginning of his travail there, okay, there's Butler. At the end of his travails there, there's Butler, okay? Mm. And by the way, it wasn't until I dug into the Inca files, because um, they're, they're at the Royal New Orleans uh, collection in New Orleans, that I began to see how important Butler was in the whole operation of Inca. Okay. He was really very much involved. All right. So I think that's important to point out. Right. And in Inca basically they, it was a, a propaganda, uh, like a Spanish yes. language propaganda kind of thing. Very close to the CIA. The yeah. CIA distributed a lot of their stuff. Okay. Right. Well, when and by the when way, and by the way, the guy involved was Ted Shackley. Mm. OK, you know, the guy out of Jam Wave. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, when, when you're doing coups all over, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> South America, it's good to have some some Spanish, some Spanish language propaganda yeah. in the mix. That's good. All right. Uh, there was also uh, William Monahan, who's a former FBI agent, the VP, and, you know, as a standalone, who cares if you have one FBI agent? Um, but but there's a lot of things going on here. Um, Jerry Patrick Hemming told Garrison that Riley worked for the CIA. And there's a CIA memo that says Riley Coffee was of interest as of 1949. That's earlier. That's not 1963. But they had an agency number assigned. I mean, I don't I don't know what to make of like the, the significance of the agency number. And then there's Adrian Alba. There's a story about him seeing Oswald take an envelope from an FBI agent who also had access to special Secret Service cars. And, you know, Alba says he saw this and Oswald kind of like shadily got this envelope and walked away so uh, i got what, what are your thoughts on the just riley coffee i mean what was the point of the riley coffee job and you know, what are your thoughts on riley it's two blocks from banister's office 
Okay. That's, I think that's very interesting. All right. Uh, you know, and uh, so in other words, you know, Oswald could have been there. And see, one of the really interesting things about Riley Coffee Company is that hardly anybody ever remembers him doing anything, okay, that, uh, you know, wh while he was there. I mean, I think his official title was he was supposed to oil some machines mm -hmm. or something like that, yep. okay? Uh, but it's very, very weird, his whole employment there, all right, and how he sort of kind of just wrote it out, okay? Uh, and nobody remembers him officially leaving, okay? You know, and, and so, and so, you know, I, I, I believe that in retrospect, I believe that that was just like a positioning place for him, okay, to keep him, uh, you know, close to Guy Bannister, all right, so that he could walk over there, you know, uh, almost any time he wanted to, you know, et cetera, all right. And uh, when I called the Riley Coffee Company, it was really funny. I I don't know if you read this in my book. And I talked to the, I think William Riley the fourth, okay, you know, and I, and I asked him about this, and and he said, "What year was that assassination? Was it 1964?" Okay, all right. Now, come on, please. <laughs> all right, Th this was around this. By the way, this was around the 50th anniversary. Okay, so I'm sorry, Bill. I, you know, I don't buy that you don't remember where it was. Okay, <laughs> you know when it was. You know, so anyway, him and, him and George H. W. Bush are the only people who were <laughs> on the I don't know where they were. He only works there for two months at Riley Coffee, so uh, maybe it's a way to say like, oh no, what are you talking about? He had a job. He worked at Riley Coffee, and then he got fired. I mean, it's it's not like he just went there to go hand out flyers. I guess maybe that's the purpose. I don't know. Then there's the the, the other little part of Riley that's related to that is NASA. So let's talk about no, Riley. No, Coffee. that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Let's yeah let's let's uh, hit on that. This real is quick. this is so fascinating, you know. Four um, of Oswald's co-workers, including right. his supervisor and someone hired on the same day as him, took jobs working with NASA or NASA contractors near New Orleans during the two-month window when Oswald worked at Riley Coffee. And Adrian Alba, uh, who owned the uh, the garage next door that had the waiting room where people would hang out and where Oswald would always hang out, said that Oswald told him that he was going to be leaving Riley Coffee to take a new job at the NASA Michou facility so right any ideas on what's going on there oh gordon novell was there also okay was that was that where at at that that nasa base oh Michu, okay. i didn't know that yeah yeah he, he he was there also okay now what's really interesting about that is that gordon novell tried to blow up a movie theater <laughs> as, a, as a 16 year old and when, when I talked to Lou Ivon, I said, how the heck does somebody who tried to blow up a movie theater get into NASA? You know? <laughs> yeah. So there was, there was obviously something going on with this whole thing, okay? You know, uh, with all these guys going to NASA. You know, I, I don't believe it was just a coincidence, okay? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I believe it was to, I think Garrison thought that it was to keep the investigation away from the people who were around Oswald at the Riley Coffee Company, okay, in early mm -hmm. 1963, all right? But, uh, you know, that is an utterly fascinating, fascinating incident, okay, that uh, I, 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 I don't think you can explain it away benignly. You know, I think yeah. something was really going on. You you brought up Gordon Gordon uh, Novell. Uh, how do you how do you say his last name? Gordon Novell. Gordon Gordon Novell. Yeah. Novell. Yeah. Um, he, I, I watched a whole interview with him, and I've read a lot of different things about him, and people talking about him. I, I, it's hard for me to peg down kind of what his deal is. What? How, how would you? What? What's your assessment of? I guess Gordon. Like his his. Yeah, like like is he Gordon, telling the truth Gordon or is he was saying lots for, of different stuff or Gordon was working for the CIA as a off the books contract employee from about 1961. Okay. 
when he was part of the Bay of Pigs operation. In fact, we're going to get to the whole Schlumberger thing, right? He was right. a part of that, of, of transferring those arms. Okay. Right. All right. Now, he stayed with the CIA off and on as a contract agent, you know, for a number of years. And then they brought him back to infiltrate Garrison's investigation in, I believe, late 1966, early 1967, you know, and then to go ahead and propagandize against Garrison once Garrison found out that he was an infiltrator. All right. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that Gordon was associated uh, with, and of course, in my book, if you read my book, the guy who hired him to infiltrate Garrison's office was Alan Dulles. All right. Mm -hmm. And and the reason yes. he hired Gordon is because Gordon was his, an expert electronics wizard. Okay. And, and Dulles wanted him to wire uh, Garrison, which he did, by the way. There were, there were two wirings of Garrison's office, one by Gordon and one by the FBI. Mm -hmm. So when people look at that scene in JFK, you know, where he discovers his office is wired. Well, not only is that true, but it's true twice. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't end up going uh, deep into the efforts to infiltrate the garrison investigation or to, or to turn it just because well, you could have a whole show so on that much and in <laughs> and and season three uh spoiler i'm sure i've said this before you know season two is is uh you know who was lee harvey oswald really season three is if not oswald then who and you know that's uh that's kind of related to the uh file that under when we talk about the cia uh that's that's one reason to look at them all the efforts they did to to uh get the garrison investigation off track um, but but anyway, OK, let, let's move on to uh, Judith Very Baker. All right. All right. So oh I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, except for <laughs> the only reason I'm addressing it is because it's something people often raise and people really do want to kind of know uh, what to make of it. And if she's telling the truth, then that's she's a huge witness. So I just want to, you know, th that's that's the only reason to go through it. It's not just to talk about this lady. Um, so. She says that she worked at Riley Coffee. And by the way, I've met her before. She's a very nice person. It's fine. It's good. Um, if she sees this, no offense, but this is a major historical event. So we're just kind of go going, going through the facts as we understand them. Uh, she says that she worked at Riley Coffee with Oswald, and she says she was his mistress in New Orleans. And the reason it really matters is because she said he's a government agent involved in a plot against Kennedy and that he tried to stop the plot. So whether or not she's telling the truth is really the question. Arguments for her credibility... She appears to be a legit science scholar coming out of high school. I mean, you know, there's newspaper articles about it. Uh, a lot of what she says is you can corroborate that the thing happened, but you can't corroborate that she was a part of it. So, you know, she talks about David Ferry uh, doing lab work and having these mice. Well, David Ferry was found to have mice uh, at his house, lab mice. Uh, you know, Dr. Mary Sherman was was killed and uh, that's still an unsolved murder. Um, so and she says she was working with Dr. Sherman. She's got W2 statements at Riley Coffee in the back of her book. Those have not been authenticated, but they also haven't been you know proven to be false. Um, and then there's Anna Lewis, who's the wife of, uh, I forget the guy's first name, but her, her husband worked in, in Bannister's office. David Lewis. She, David <laughs> Lewis, yeah. She says she went on a double date with Baker and Oswald. So, you know, now this is in a statement. She's not on the record and it's not an affidavit. It's just a statement. But, but uh, I believe. But so those are arguments for her credibility. And, and that's why I think a lot of people do go, man, yes, she probably was Oswald's mistress and everything she's saying, let's just plug that piece in because it fits so perfectly. I mean, what she's saying, you go, oh, this is going on. This is going on. Uh, Oaksner is going on. All these things are happening. It, it, that part, you know, you, you look at it and you go, yeah, that, that, could, that could fit. Arguments against her credibility. No one at Riley Coffee remembers seeing her there. No one. But as you said, that's not that different from Oswald. Um, there, yeah, Adrian Alba is the big one that, that's all over seeing Oswald there. No proof of her ties to Dr. Oaksner, no proof of her ties to Dr. Sherman. And, you know, she, she said that Clay Shaw paid 
for her and Oswald to to uh, hook up during the day in hotels because he felt bad for them, <laughs> um, which I found to be implausible. <laughs> and the, the, my biggest thing that I found to be implausible here, and I and maybe I'm wrong in this because Fairy actually does have mice, but you're gonna you know Oswald has no background whatsoever in in you know biology and, and, and researching cancer cells that's the he's, he's zero points he knows as much about that as i do okay or he, he would have at the time so why would you involve him barry is not you know clinic if the cia wanted to do this wouldn't they have like some sort of like science lab contracted i mean you know wouldn't they just work directly i, I don't know it just it didn't seem to make sense to me but but uh but then i know that uh that, there's several articles online of like a hundred different contradictions in her book. There are folks that are, most of these folks are on the, uh, the uh, Oswald acted alone side, but I, you know, I look at their work and I go, this, this does seem, you know, it's like, she said she went to Cancun at some time on vacation and it was before there were any hotels in Cancun, something like that. There's just little things like that all over the place, but you're little, your thoughts, little, <laughs> they add up. yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, okay. All right. Why didn't she go to Garrison? Why didn't she go to the House Select Committee? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, the, the, two thousand one, I think, is when she came forward, right? Something like it was very late. All right, and I'm, I know. I are you aware that the the so called letters that Oswald sent to her have the corners clipped off? Okay, mm -hmm. so that the real, you know, return address, it was those were really from her husband. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. She was taking a Russian class that she said was specially designed for her in high school. When in fact that class was installed two years before she mm -hmm. took it. You can go on and on for all you know all these things. She said she was living in exile as a political prisoner in Sweden, when in fact they never granted her asylum the whole time she was there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Etc. All right. Yeah. Anyway, yep. you know, those are the, all the problems. Well, those are just a few. You can go on. There's literally dozens of sure. problems with her story. So, yeah, but I mean, obviously, she knows a lot. Well, let's about not the forget case. Carlos Marcello actually got a cottage for uh, her and Lee. OK, oh, that her. was nice of him. <laughs> that was nice. I didn't know. Carlos okay. was such a good but guy. it's, you know, That's it's great. hard to keep track because there's so many different manuscripts of her mm. story. OK. You know, there's there's at least three of them that I know of. OK, so it's hard to keep track of her story as it evolves through time. Sure. Sure. So, yeah, so we'll we'll land on uh, that story being doubtful, We shall we say. Okay. Um, you're, right. you're, 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 you're too kind, Matt. Too <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. All right. Uh, next next issue slash question. Does the lack of a lookout card being in Oswald's file prove anything? And I, I was going to cover this during the Soviet Union section, but I thought, hey, he's going to actually get the passport uh, in in the summer of 63. Well, let's cover it then. So he goes and he gets a new passport in New Orleans in June of 63. His prior passport had travel restrictions placed on it when he came back from the Soviet Union. And his he was able to even though, you know, he had this issue in the Soviet Union and he had travel restrictions and he had attempted to defect in the Soviet Union, uh, his passport was approved in 24 hours. Now, this is weird because there should have been a lookout card in place to to stop it, um, to, to basically stop the, the passport from being issued, you know, as a matter of course. Um, now, um, there's three different times when there should have been a lookout card and there wasn't. And I'm going to get to those in just a second. But first, the classified box is checked on Oswald's file, we learned in these lookout cards in CE 983. What a, what's the significance of that? I mean, is that the smoking gun that it sounds like? That it's like, oh, this is classified. There must be something top secret about this guy. Or is it just, I mean, do, do you know how what, what to make of that box? No, no, I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know why they would classify it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it seems kind of weird to me. It It's it's one of those things where if it was one thing, you go, ah, uh, but you add it to the pile. And it's that's why, you know, we're talking about the uh, the Trump assassination attempt and, you know, whether or not that's a conspiracy and what's going on and yada, yada, yada. Studying the JFK case lets you see, you know, what a conspiracy looks like in, in my view. And I know in your view, because there are so many points that reinforce there are hundreds, maybe a thousand touch points that you By go. By the way, that's what, weird, what, what, that's what weird, you that's just weird. said. What you just said about throwing it on the pile, 
That's exactly what Wesley Liebler said when he was working. <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's another one for the pile. That's another <laughs> But yeah, like in, well, in, when when the pile gets to be over a hundred, <laughs> I, I I think it's more than just the pile. I think there's a serious problem. Yeah, okay? for sure. But you can't. But but when someone goes, oh, this lady in the video looked over to the right before the shots. She must have been in on it. Okay, <laughs> that's one thing. You got anything else? You know, I'm like, so, I mean, who knows? Maybe things will come out on that. I'm open minded on that. But but anyway, um. All right, so lookout cards. Uh, we, we got the, we got the classified box check. See the, the the lookout cards, as Sylvia Marr wrote in her book, Accessories After the Fact. There were three instances where there should have been a lookout card. Yes. One when they got the news of the, of the, of his defection. All right, one when they lost him. Okay, they lost him in Russia. Okay, so there should have been a lookout card in case he showed up somewhere else. Okay, without and then there should have been one on the loan, okay, that he got from the State Department, okay, mm -hmm. to keep. And she says the first one you might be able to excuse, okay, but right. the last two, according to the State Department's regulations, there should have been a lookout card. All right, on on both those instances, why was there not one? You know, it's a, it's a very, very weird situation. Especially because, so for the first one, the the plausible argument is, oh, he didn't technically defect, right. so they decided not to do it. All right, fine. For the second one, um, the issue there is you've got Bernice Waterman in the State Department who says, no, 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 I created the refusal sheet myself, which is the step before a lookout card. She's like, no, there's there's no reason. She tries to make up a – maybe it got added to the pile with some other things and some things got confused. But she – you know, in the in the Warren Commission, she's she's saying, you know, in, in her testimony um, that uh, it she, it doesn't make sense to her. And then the last one, the, uh, the loan, the official story on why there was no lookout card made for the loan is clerical error. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. what you do when you're just like uh we haven't used clerical error yet let's use that one so all right, so there you go i mean people can see if they if they believe that but but i guess that kind of gets to you know is oswald being given different treatment than a you know the average joe would get from the state department certainly seems so especially when you combine it with the auto otepka story which we, we already covered and uh Really, there's so many other things that I forget about, uh, but uh, it, it seems to fit. Um, so I don't know if it it's it is one more coincidence that makes it look like there's someone on the inside controlling Oswald's file. Oh, in addition to Otepka, there's the whole, which I haven't covered in depth yet, I've hinted at, uh, but it's a big thing. Oswald's 201 file being routed to the Office of Security instead of the Soviet Russia division. You got that, plus Otto Otepka, plus these lookout cards. Kind of, you know, plus the, the ease with which he he got into uh, the Soviet Union, all the Helsinki stuff. 13 months to open up a 201 file? Yeah, right. It took after 13 months. After okay. they're reading his mail already, then they <laughs> open it. Right. Right, exactly. So it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I agree with that. All right, let's move on to Guy Bannister. He he started out in the, F, in the FBI. And he, well, he was in naval intelligence, but his career was in the FBI. And a lot of what he did was uh, develop informers, especially leftist group infiltrators, made his way all the way up to special agent in charge of the Chicago office, had a, uh, a close professional relationship with J. Edgar Hoover, could, could get him on the phone, even when he had his detective agency in 63. Uh, he goes down and he works, he leaves being the head of the Chicago FBI office and he goes to work in New Orleans um, and ends up getting – for the police there, ends up getting fired for assaulting a bartender, which leads him to opening a detective agency. Quick, I'm going to quick stop here. Do you have any idea why he went from Chicago to New Orleans? It seems like a demotion. Like is there a reason that you know, he that's would... a, th you know, that that's a really good question. I think he had some problems uh, in, in – in, because he actually rose to the SAC – uh, in Chicago. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think he had some problems with Hoover. Okay. And, and following the regulations in Chicago. All right. And so then he decided, you know, to, uh, leave the FBI. 
Okay. And then he worked for the police department in New Orleans. Okay. He was supposed to be rooting out, if you can believe it, rooting out corruption. Okay. On the police force, you know, in New Orleans. But then he got involved in a brawl in a bar. Okay. And he evidently he decked a bartender. Okay. And so uh, that's when he um, went into this street detective work. Um, you know, uh, first at the Balter building and then at the Newman building. Okay. And, right. Which, as far as I've been able to tell, he got very good, let's put it this way, he got very good discounted deals <laughs> at, at both places to rent the offices that he did. And it wasn't mm. just an office. He had a suite of offices, okay? Um, and it's from here that he begins his, let's call it, infiltration, undercover, okay, uh, penetration uh, against the so-called leftist element in New Orleans, okay? And I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, he would clear his agents with the office that Shaw's lawyers were working at. Were you aware of that? I don't no. know if that, I think that's in my book, okay? Um, and in fact, so he would submit a name. Okay. He would send it to that office where I think Bill to Wegman. that law firm? Yeah. Bill Wegman worked at. Who ended okay. up, it was one of Shaw's lawyers. Okay. All right. And, uh, <laughs> and he would, and they would do the rundown on the guy for him. Okay. Now, again. Uh -huh. I get, that's another thing to throw on the pile. Was was throw that just a was that just a coincidence or you know? Uh, yeah. So and in fact, in fact, one of the lawyers who worked in that office, who actually did the work, was announced as one of Shaw's lawyers on the eve of the trial. Uh, you know, the the indictment rather, and then he resigned. Okay, he resigned. Uh, from the team. I think it was just too obvious, you know, et cetera, that, uh, that there was a connection there. So this is where Bannister begins his career. All right. Um, and he's involved in the Bay of Pigs. Okay. He's involved in Mongoose. All right. Um, and there's many, many witnesses to this. Okay. And, uh, and then of course, out of nowhere. Oh, wait a minute. We, we we can't we can't miss the Friends of Democratic Cuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, go go ahead and do your rundown yeah, of the Friends of Democratic right. Cuba. Let, let let me just ask you just real quick before we get to that because that's next. Um, his agency. He had a few detectives quit working for him because he refused to take detective work off the street. He just like wasn't. He was turning down work to focus on his infiltrating of leftist groups. I mean, does that? Does that pretty much suggest that he's going to be making money somewhere? Someone's paying him. Is there a government agency writing a check? Well, I, so did, I, I would I mean, think that that clearly suggests that, you know, he wasn't really reliant on the work, whatever work came in right. to, to, to his so-called detectives, you know, that he had another avenue, you know, of funding for, for right. what he was doing. I mean, come on. What were all those Cubans doing there? What were all those Cuban <laughs> exiles doing there? OK, you know, I mean, uh, it, it was like a way station, yeah. you know, infiltrating you know, and, leftist groups doesn't pay for itself. <laughs> so, yeah, someone's got to right. pay something. So, OK, the board of uh, the Friends for Democratic Cuba. So Guy Bannister is on the board of this uh, in, uh, corporation. And this is the group that uh, that ended up having a Lee Oswald impersonator sign up for rental trucks at Bolton Ford in 1961, when we know that Oswald was in Minsk and another board member of the friends of democratic Cuba 
happened to be Gerard Tujag, who was Oswald's old boss at the importing exporting company. So small world, weird stuff. What are the chances <laughs> that, I mean, what, like, what are the chances that the group, I'm just saying like this, that I don't know that there's a good count. The, the counterpoint for this is, uh, I, you know, someone looks at these facts and they go, no, I think it's just a coincidence, but I just don't think you can do that being aware of all the other information, the pile, as we've <laughs> called it. To have two of the board members to have employed Oswald, okay, to have then his name appear on this order, okay, for these Jeeps to go into Cuba, all right, in 1961, I mean, I mean, come on. Please. All right. I mean, it's just it just, you know, it just it defies any kind of logic, you know, or uh, or rationale that you could possibly think of. You know, yeah. I mean, it had to be more than a coincidence, you know. And by the way, that is. What we're talking about here is a proven fact. It's not conjecture. OK, it's not implication. The evidence is right there. OK, it's right. It's, it's right there. The witnesses, the, the signatures the written down, et cetera. You know, OK, so mm -hmm. this is really a very, very bizarre incident that I really don't. Again, like I said earlier, how do you explain that in a benign way? You know, using right. Oswald's name in 1961 with two of the people who are going to be employing him in 1963, you know? I mean, it's also when we think about it. Well, what is this Lee Oswald, who's by, who's you know at Bolton Ford? He's uh, acting on behalf of a uh, of an anti Castro group. But when Lee Oswald comes on the scene in the summer of '63, he's obviously pro Castro. So I, that just made me think, like, I don't know, maybe they were just using the name Lee Oswald, so, you know, as just. <laughs> Like it, the, the whole conversation of him being impersonated and there's, there's the Harvey and Lee thing separately, but the whole conversation um, it's confusing trying to figure out what the purpose of that was. Cause that was clearly happening, but that's a, mm -hmm. that's a, a much bigger topic. Um, all right, let's move on to Schlumberger Huma raid. So uh, Bannister, basically there's this newspaper story about how he had all these munitions in his office uh, from the uh, Schlumberger raid. And the raid was backed by uh, the CIA, according to Gordon Novell and Sergio Arcacha Smith's lawyer. And so that that all seems to fit. Now, there's the whole OAS part of the story and, and you know, what exactly was going on there. Uh, I couldn't find concrete support for that. I, I know Jim Garrison said that in his book, but but I didn't I didn't know what his uh you know, what he was relying on. Your your thoughts on uh, what we can learn from Homa and, and the, the Schlumberger raid? It's it's an utterly fascinating episode, okay, in which you had all of these guys, okay, like you mentioned a couple of them, Gordon and Sergio Arcacha Smith, all right, uh, and, and three or four others. I think Ferry might have been involved also. Ferry. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and they're transferring these this weapons from this bunker, okay, which uh, is from this giant French conglomerate. Schlumberger, okay, which has a munitions outfit, you know, to, to go along with this giant conglomerate. All right. And they're trans and, and they had the key. They had the key to the bunker. Okay. And they rented <laughs> this truck. Okay. And they transferred these weapons, you know, from this Schlumberger company, all right, to Bannister's office. All right. Now, first of all, how did they get the key? Uh, how the <laughs> heck did they get the key to this? You know, did, did Gordon just go into the front office and say, hey, give me the key, want to take these weapons back to Bannister's office? How did they do that? You know, and then they go there in these secret black clothes. OK, and I, I actually think that they had their, you know, the shadow makeup also on it so they would maintain secrecy. All right. And then bring them back to Bannister's office. You know, now, Gar as you mentioned, Garrison thought that this was a, a, a transfer that the CIA had arranged from 
the OAS uh, to mm-hmm. uh, to the anti Castro Cuban exiles. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Okay, it's a very interesting supposition. It might mm-hmm. be true. It might not be true. Okay, but this shows you just how involved, okay, Bannister was with this anti Castro Cuban exile underground that mm-hmm. he could go to these kinds of links to supply them with weapons. It's it's really kind of amazing when you think about it. There's this great CIA memo that it's talking about the Garrison case and it kind of breaks down all the key players and all these different things in it. And it talks about the Schlumberger company and, and the Homeraid, Homeraid, Homa, not Homa, <laughs> sorry, Homa, Homeraid. <laughs> anyway, uh, and what they say is uh, in, in like hilarious CIA language, they go, yeah, we, we worked with these guys before. We're not going to tell you when. We still work with them now. <laughs> <laughs> but like in, in a way that's like they went to Yale. You know what I mean? Our relationship <laughs> with said corporation is ongoing. But, you know, crap like that. But um, but that was kind of funny. And then Bannister. So just back to Bannister. He uh, he worked regularly with David Ferry and Sergio Arcacha Smith. Sergio Arca- you know, Sergio Arcacha Smith tried to deny he knew Ferry. And then they talked, somebody tracked down his wife and she goes, didn't know Ferry? Ferry was at our house watching films of the Bay of Pigs. If anything shows you how plugged in Sergio Arcacha Smith was to the CIA, when he has films of the Bay of Pigs invasion at his house, home movies, you know, most people, they go on a picnic, they go to Washington, they take, here's a guy showing the Bay of Pigs invasion at his house, okay? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that is crazy. Um, Well, all right, so next thing is when it comes to Bannister, did Bannister know Lee Harvey Oswald? Okay, let's. Uh, is that supposed to be a serious question? Well, that... it's, <laughs> it's really. Uh, there are, you know. He admitted uh, it. He did to multiple people. Yeah, but, right. but the counter, the counter. How's it going to look? He said with my address uh-huh, on his. Right. <laughs> the the counter argument is every witness that said those things is a liar. Every so, one of them. All nine one of them. them. I'm, that's <laughs> all. Yes, that truly. That true. Like, look. One of the things I'm trying to do in this podcast is really get the I, – I don't want to misstate um, Warren Report defenders' positions. So I truly – I'm looking to find, like, what really is the counterargument? And it's just that don't believe any of these witnesses. But I don't know, man. It's like it's like Bill Cosby. The first one came <laughs> out. I'm like, I love Bill. I, I'll, I'm, I eat pudding pops. We're good. The second one came out. I'm like, Bill, the Cosby show is an American institution. The 43rd one came out, and I was like, <laughs> I think he's got to go. <laughs> it's kind of It's kind of like that. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, Dan, let's get... Dan Campbell yes. is a very credible witness. I met with him twice. Mm-hmm. OK, did you talk about him on your show? I, I mentioned him and in, in your conversation with him. But go ahead. Unpack it. OK, I interviewed Dan twice, once in New Orleans on the phone and once in L.A. He was staying at uh, Stephen Stills house because Stephen oh. Stills had opened up a bar. Uh, and he stayed at his house in L.A. And I went to visit him in his backyard. Okay, Dan Campbell said that when he and his brother saw Oswald walk in to Bannister's office, they immediately knew something was wrong. OK, uh, because this guy did not act like any street urchin or any kind of, uh, you know, private detective. He had the posture and the movement and Dan had been in the service. Okay. He said, that's what he walked like. That's what his posture was like. That's the way he acted. Okay. You know, and then when the assassination broke, him and his brother went into hiding. They were really afraid. Okay. Because wait a minute. How could this guy be working for Guy Bannister and shooting cat? <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. And so and so he he told me all this stuff about how, how bad Bannister was, you know, one of the most frightening, violent people he's ever met. And he said he was running guns to Alpha 66, you know, in in uh, in Florida. Okay. And he was being paid big time by the CIA. So when you asked his question, 
earlier about, well, where did he get his money? Well, there it is. You know, Dan Campbell knew. Now, Dan was recruited to infiltrate colleges because I think he was about 19 years old when he started working, you know, for uh, uh, for for Bannister. And that's how he got to know him. OK, by infiltrating colleges as a as, as, as a pseudo leftist. OK, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I find Dan Campbell very, very credible. All right. You know, and as along with the eight other people that I named. OK. Uh, in, yeah. In, in my yeah. book. All right. And then there's the fact, you know, that Bannister. Was so angry. OK. When he found out that Oswald had put his address on the Corliss Lamont pamphlet. You know, he even shouted something like, come on, how's this going to make me look? OK, right. when they find out about this, you know. Uh -huh. All right. OK, then you have, of course, uh, Bringel, who was one of the secretaries there. And she heard about this, you know, from Delphine Roberts. Delphine Roberts didn't want to talk to Garrison. OK, not at all. She wouldn't say anything to him because Bannister had sworn her to secrecy. OK, then the House Select Committee, they tried to talk to her, but she wouldn't talk. All right. And then finally, the very last days of the House Select Committee, Bob Burris, who was one of the investigators in New Orleans, OK, he got her to open up a little bit, okay, about Oswald being there, about what Bannister was doing. But then finally, I believe in 79, I think Anthony Summers met with her in New Orleans and it was at her lawyer's office. And Summer said this was a really right wing John Bircher type lawyer mm. and he t he told her not to talk. OK, so then after that meeting, it was raining like a, if you've ever been in New Orleans, it always rains in the afternoon. OK, and. Uh, Tony had rented a car, was driving out from the parking lot. She was standing there in the rain. OK, outside the building. And he said, do you need a ride? OK, and so she jumped in the car. And then. He said he he really didn't provoke her on anything. OK, he didn't try and be any kind of inquisitive. He said about halfway to her house, she started crying. OK, <laughs> and she said words of the effect that I'm not going to conceal this anymore. Okay. And that's when it all started pouring out. Okay. And she went into the whole thing, you know, about Oswald being there, mm -hmm. about Bannister going up to Bannister and saying, you know, there's this guy out there leafleting and Bannister goes, be quiet. He's one of ours. OK, mm -hmm. you know, about about an office, he, he even talked to her daughter and her daughter vouched for seeing Oswald there, right. you know, at 544 Camp Street. And like Bannister had given him a little office where he worked on 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 uh, his literature. OK, so. There's another one, there's Vernon Gertis, right? OK, who is is another guy who saw Oswald there. OK, so. There's Connie Martin, mm -hmm. you know, who did translating work for, right. for Bannister. OK, so in, in my I, I think there's I put nine of them in my book. OK, yes. and so uh, I think it's pretty uh, it's pretty overwhelming that he was there. And oh, oh I forgot. I forgot the INS agents. Mm -hmm. OK, the INS agents, two INS agents. Were tracking Ferry because Ferry was associating with all these illegal Cuban exiles. OK, and so they tracked him and they tracked him to Bannister's office and they said 
that they saw Oswald. And, and when the church committee called the guy up, I think his name was David Smith, okay? Uh, yeah. When the church committee calls this guy up, he says, the, the agent says words to the effect, we want to talk to you about Oswald in New Orleans with Ferry. And he said, I've been waiting 12 years to tell somebody about wow. that. <laughs> That's something. And, and yeah. on top on top of the ones you just mentioned, there's there's the, the two that the HSCA uh, sort of uses to dismiss Oswald and Bannister, which are Delphine Roberts and Jack Martin. <laughs> they go, Delphine Roberts is a liar. She gave inconsistent yeah, okay. stories. Jack Martin's a drunk, you know, uh-huh. and uh, we're not going to listen to them. But uh, but they did. They are witnesses. And then there's also Michael Kurtz, who says that he saw Oswald and Bannister together at LSU and also Mancuso's restaurant. Tommy Baumler also well, works for Tommy Bannister. Tommy Baumler is a terrific witness. Yeah. You know, but you know why? Because Tommy Baumler was a right wing nut. OK. <laughs> sure. All right. He was he was a really, really crazy right winger who over time became a kind of respected attorney, hmm. you know, in in New Orleans. And the House Select Committee tracked him down. But they but but see, this is what they did, and I'm sure you're aware of this. See, things like this they classified. They mm-hmm. <laughs> so we didn't find out about Tommy Baumler, okay, until the ARB came along. And he says, I know for a fact that Oswald worked for Bannister, because I worked for Bannister. Okay. <laughs> you know, right. So, you know, I, I don't see how it gets any better than that. OK, I mean, it's it's you know, it, it's really kind of ridiculous to deny this. You know, I mean, come on. If Oswald wasn't there, how did 544 Camp Street end up on the flyer? You uh, know? Well, well, we'll get to that. And there is a counterpoint, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't buy, but there it, it exists. Um, last thing on these witnesses. So we talked about the HSCA, you know, basically uh, straw manning this whole conversation by by throwing out Delphine Roberts and Jack Martin, not mentioning any of the other witnesses. William Gaudet, they interviewed him and he talked about seeing Oswald, uh, you know, with Bannister on the street and this interaction where it looked like Bannister was trying to get him to do something. That's it. That's in their FBI report. And in the same report, he talks about uh, Mexico City and, you know, whether or not Oswald was really in Mexico City and and, and all that. The HSCA uses Gade for his Mexico City points, but ignores and dismisses and, and doesn't disclose until they're later declassified what he said about Oswald with Bannister. Mm-hmm. So they've, they've right. determined him to be a credible witness, but don't look over here at what he said. <laughs> That's kind of seems yeah. to be what's going on. They, they, they buried Gade. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, you know, and Gaudet a is a very things. interesting guy, okay, uh, because he had like almost a rent free office at Clay Shaw's International Trademark, where he was working for the CIA as a, as a contract agent, putting out some literature, okay, to go into South America. Very interesting guy, w- William Gaudet. All right, so now we're going now we're on to 544 Camp Street, which is related conversation. Before the question was. Did Bannister know Oswald? Now we're talking about what's up with this 544 Camp Street stamp. And just to be clear, this is not the only thing that the 544 stamp is on is the Kurt, the uh, uh, Lamont pamphlet, right? The other ones are like uh, AJ Hiddell, mag, you know, Magazine Street. Well, l- sure, l- right? let's put it this way: that's the only one that survived. Okay, I wouldn't sure. put it past the sure. FBI, you know, to have gone because that one. The one that we were talking about, they were dumb enough to put that in the Warren Commission. I think right. that's like in volume 25. Mm-hmm. Okay. You yeah, know, it's an but, but see what, what happened is see the early critics like Weisberg, like Sylvia Marr, mm-hmm. like Mark Lane, they had never been to New Orleans. Okay. So even though they probably were aware of the Corliss Lamont document they couldn't put the association together, okay, right. of 544 Camp Street. So when Garrison, because he was the DA there, when he sees this 544 Camp Street, you know, he walks over, okay, and the big light goes on in his head. Oh, my God, this is Guy Bannister's place, all right, you know, 
And so that is how the importance of that Corliss Lamont document, okay, gets magnified. It right. was it was really Jim Garrison's discovery. Now the now I'm, let, let me qualify that. Obviously, the FBI knew about that, and they and they tried to conceal it. Okay, mm-hmm. you know, but there there was there was simply no concealing it. You know, as 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 time went on, and uh, and five forty four Camp Street really became a kind of constant meme. You know, in right. in, in in the assassination literature. You got five thirty one Lafayette. Is, is actually Bannister's office, but that's the first floor. The second floor is a, a different door, and that's 544 Camp Street. But it literally right. is the same office building, the second yes. floor. Also, Bannister's like related offices of the, the – you, you said he had a suite of offices, the folks he worked with. A lot of those folks were on the second floor, 544 Camp Street, the, some of those different offices. So so it does – it is effectively the same building, Um and uh, FPCC flyers were seen in offices on the second floor by Delphine Roberts, Jack Martin, and Bill Nitschke. Uh, Consuela Martin was, as you as you mentioned, was a Bannister translator who said Oswald would often come to her to ask to have her translate things for him. Now, here here are the counterpoints on five forty four camp. You ready? Okay. There's no lease. Show me the lease. And the counterpoint oh is God. no one ever said there was a lease. So that's not an argument anyone's making. Uh, people said that no, he had this office that the banister allowed him to use. So, so, so anyway, so I guess that's no problem. The tenants, uh, the the other tenants in the building, uh, uh-huh. uh, said that that they had never seen Oswald to the HSCA investigator. Now, what's the definition of a tenant? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Who exactly are they talking about? Are they talking about what did they? I mean, because Guy Banister's dead. Who do they ask? Who are they talking to? You know what yeah. I mean? Like. I don't know the details of that, but that's, but that to me, you know, somebody on the third floor, who's technically the guy that signed the lease, that doesn't mean he's going to be there and see Oswald. And so, mm-hmm. so anyway, um, and then the last thing is, this is my favorite. Uh, the reason they, the 544 camp street, there's nothing going on there. As we know, everyone that says that they saw Oswald must be mistaken or lying. These like a dozen people we've, we've brought up. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the reason Oswald was doing it, is was using 544 Camp Street is because he knew that that used to be the uh, the Cuban Revolutionary Council's address, and he once he must have seen uh, a flyer that with the, with their name and associated with that address, even though they were gone a year earlier. There must have been an old flyer before that, that was still around when he was in New Orleans, and he then saw that flyer, which we have no proof of any of this, but he saw that flyer and he said, "I'm going to use 544 Camp Street to troll these guys." Ha ha ha. That's that's truly the argument. That's so silly. Uh, it's 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 not even worth replying to. You know? Right. Well, well, okay. the reason the only reason I raise it, even though it is, I don't raise it to ridicule it. I raise it to go. There's nothing here, guys. There's there is no counterpoint. There's nothing like this. This happened. So um, see, the thing is, when when you add in. What Oswald was doing that spring and summer, OK, I mean, it becomes pretty overwhelming. Okay, he he has this undercover phase, which mm-hmm. John Newman talks about in Oswald and the CIA, where he's going to these uh, universities, okay, mm-hmm. and dropping off this literature, trying right. to smoke out what he considers to be uh, leftist kind of influences or pro-Castro influences on these campuses. Then he tries to infiltrate uh, the DRE, you know, Carlos Springier's outfit, okay? Mm -hmm. Then he breaks out in public with this almost amazing, um, and by the way, you said that Jesse Core alerted WDSU about the leafleting at the ITM. There's a guy who worked at WSDDSU and said that was on the agenda when we got to work that day. (laughs) You you believe that? Is is that amazing or what? You know, That's that's how much WDSU was in the pocket of the CIA. You know, if that's a true story. Okay. 
it's so, it's something the uh, yeah uh, now, now, here, now here's that something it. else that's, that somebody told me ray marcus used to be a communist he's a researcher in the jfk community i don't know if he's still alive or not he said jim i knew that oswald was an arjun provocateur from the moment the news broke because you don't go on a public street like canal street in new orleans and leaflet for a cause like that see mm -hmm. what you do is you go at night and you drop the literature off in the foyer because you know people will be embarrassed to see themselves in public especially with cameras around mm -hmm. okay so i knew from from just that you know that Oswald was not a genuine communist all right so when you when you add in all this stuff okay you know plus the fact you know i've never been able to figure this out how did oswald get fined for receiving a punch okay <laughs> <laughs> right 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 yeah I've, I've never seen that in the criminal code receiving a punch fined okay <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. Well, uh, so the way Oswald starts out his his FPCC like flyering activities in New Orleans is a thousand orders of a six by nine FPCC handbill at Jones Printing Company, which is across the street from Riley Coffee, and he orders it under the name Osborne. But the two people that are, are at the print shop when the guy came to pick it up said that. The guy that picked it up did not look anything like Lee Harvey Oswald. And um, years later, I guess, and I didn't cover this in the show, but I want to just run it by you and get your thoughts on it. Uh, Harold Weisberg apparently t told Earl Goals that uh, he had showed the the two the two folks that were there at the print shop a picture of uh -huh. Carrie Thornley, and they uh -huh. both identified Carrie Thornley as the guy who who picked up the uh, the yes. flyers. Have you heard that before? That's, that's true. Yes. What do you think that's about? We and we haven't covered Carrie Thornley it's, on my show. It's at it's, all. it's 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 yeah. a heck of an interesting story, isn't it? You know, if <laughs> yeah. if that if that's Thornley going to Jones Printing Company to pick up those flyers, because more than one witness saw Thornley at five forty four Camp Street. Right. Okay. You know, it, it, I wrote about seven pages about Carrie Thornley mm -hmm. in the second edition of Destiny Betrayed. Okay, but that would take too long to go into the whole thing. Let's put it this way. Carrie Thornley wrote a book about Oswald in 1961, and he showed it to Guy Bannister. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, Carrie Thornley is a very, very interesting character, uh, to, to put it mildly. All right. If he picked up those flyers, then it shows you how close he was to Oswald, because this is something he always denied. He denied that he ever met Oswald in New Orleans in the summer of 1963. Mm -hmm. That's why Garrison indicted him, because Garrison had about six witnesses, you know, who saw Thornley with Oswald in the summer of 1963. OK, so uh, that's one indication, you know, of of what on earth Oswald was up to in that in that summer of 1963. He's handing the flyers out and he has an interaction with he sees his lawyer, Dean Andrews, who he had, uh, you know, gone to see Dean Andrews about trying to get his uh, his discharge from the Marines uh, change to an honorable discharge. And um, and anyway, the, the headline is that Andrews asked him what he was doing, handing these these flyers out. And Oswald said he was getting paid to do it, and he was working. He was getting paid twenty five dollars a day, which is double mm -hmm. what he made at Riley Coffee Company. And mm -hmm. then when you combine that with the Corliss Lamont pamphlet, which is the crime against Cuba, uh, this is I, I found this to be this is wild. It stamps got the five forty four Camp Street stamp, but it also is uh, the the 
it's on the fourth edition in 1963. So if you're going to, you know, obviously it's a different time. You're going to order a pamphlet. You're not going to print it from your home computer or, or or download it and look at it on your phone or your tablet. You got to call the print shop and they have to have, they're going to print the current edition of it. So he would have gotten a fourth edition in 1963. There's no evidence of him actually ordering any of these. This would have been more expensive because this is like a 39 page document, I believe. Anyway, um, and he had enough of them to hand out. So it turns out that the one he had was a first edition. So uh, he would have had to have ordered that in 1961 before. Uh, before no, there came. there is a counter argument to this. Okay. 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 So what is it? And 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 that's that. Uh, he might have ordered it from the Fair Play Cubic Committee in New York. Okay, but my problem with that is, why would they have the first edition? if he ordered it from them in 1963, okay? I don't think they would have the first edition, okay, if they ordered if he ordered it from them in 1963. You know, there's the very interesting thing, of course, that David Phillips ordered 45 copies of mm. <laughs> that thing. Was it David 19- Phillips? Is his name on the thing? Well, okay. I know the CIA it, did. It, we it, had that it, receipt. It, it, it was a CIA, but, you know, it, it's it's – I think it was because the, he was on the FPCC in 1961. He was right. the guy, you know, doing this stuff. Okay, so it's logical to assume that he was probably responsible for sending that for sending that order in. Okay, you know, I'm not saying he did, yeah. but it's logical to assume that he did. You know, um, so this is the document that Oswald is passing out in 1963 from 1961. Mm-hmm. So it's it's utterly fascinating to wonder how the heck he got it, you know? All right? Especially We're never going to know for sure. Yeah. You've got the, the records of him ordering the thousand. Now, did Carrie Thornley pick it up or did he? I don't know. But there's record of him ordering it. We also have all the back-and-forth correspondence between him and V.T. Lee, at the Fair Play for Cuba, and there's nothing that says, "Hey man, can you send me some cordless Lamont flyer?" I mean, th- th- mm. we don't have we don't have that document, and so we are speculating, but it's like pretty weird that the CIA ordered 45 copies of this precise document in 1961 that Oswald mm. happens to have, um, and then there's the 544 Camp Street stuff that we we talked about. Um, but just quickly, Jesse Core, who's Clay Shaw's right hand man at the trademark, he is an FBI informant. And he picks up one of these pamphlets, circles 544 Camp Street, and sends it to the FBI, and he writes, note inside back cover, okay? Right. We also have a scratched out but still legible handwritten note from a special agent in charge of the New Orleans office, Harry Maynard, that says, several Fair Play for Cuba pamphlets contained address 544 Camp Street. And he crossed that out, but you can still see it. So why are they talking about it and raising it as the sole issue that they're communicating, at least for for Jesse Core, if it doesn't matter? Right. And what was Jesse Core doing on Canal Street, picking up that flyer? Okay, isn't that interesting? Because what you left out (laughs) is Jesse Core was Clay Shaw's aide de camp. Right. Okay. He was his right hand man. Okay. So Jesse Core is on Canal Street when Oswald drops the flyer and then he sends in the flyer to the FBI noting the 544 Camp Street and then he's there calling WDSU you know for Oswald's leafleting at the International Trade Mart in which Oswald just happens to hire an FBI informant Mr. Steele okay <laughs> to be one right. of his assistants you know working on that assignment. What kind of a communist goes to the unemployment office, okay, and hires people, you know, to help him leaflet at the at the international trademark. Okay. Right. Very, very bizarre. He's he's a market communist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. When you combine what Dean Andrews says about Oswald telling him he's getting paid, Jesse Core and Harry Maynard keep an eye on him. They're worried about 544 Camp Street. All the links to Guy Bannister, these first edition flyers shouldn't have. It's reasonable to assume that if Oswald's working for anyone handing out these leftist flyers, it would be Guy Bannister. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people put them together. 
and say that they know each other that we've discussed. Um, Bannister's main thing throughout his career is infiltrating leftist groups, which he was doing. And he told all these people point blank that Oswald was working for him. And we kind of hinted at earlier, you know, if Bannister's turning down all this normal paying, you know, private eye work, someone's financing this operation. There's all these folks involved. So it's like, who else could it be? And there's not the, you know, Occam's razor is a government agency. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what else it could be. Um, so let's, let's turn to Oswald in jail and uh, WDSU TV. So starting with Carlos Bringuier. So Carlos Bringuier, he's a Cuban exile who worked with the DRE, the Cuban revolutionary student directorate. And he goes into, in, in I'm sorry, Oswald, goes into Bringier's clothing store, which I believe is called Casa Roca. And at first he he buddies up with Bringier and he says, you know, he says he wants to help fight Castro, says that he's he's on the same page uh, and that he's anti-Castro. And the next day he comes back and he leaves his Marine Corps manual, I guess, sort of as like proof that, hey, I'm serious about this. But then three days after that, one of Bringier's uh, buddies sees Oswald handing out pro-Castro materials on Canal Street, and he goes and tells Bringier. And this leads to an altercation where both Oswald and Bringier and, and two of his associates are arrested. Um, when Oswald's in jail, he asked to meet with the FBI, and Agent John Quigley comes to visit him in jail. And according to William Walter, who worked for the FBI, Quigley asked him to find out if Oswald was an informant before he went to go visit him. And after after um, looking at the files, William Walter determined that Oswald was an FBI informant in more than one case. And he said he relayed that to Quigley. So there's a sort of a one of several. Under under files. Warren DeBreeze. Yes, uh, an informant for Warren DeBreeze. Yes. Right. Now, what's right. important about that is that Warren DeBreeze was bilingual. He mm. spoke Spanish. So he was, along with Regis Kennedy, who also spoke Spanish, they were the two guys on the Cuban exile desk before the FBI. All right. So they were very familiar with the CIA operations that were going on at that time out of New Orleans. So for Oswald to be assigned to debris, that's very interesting. After Oswald gets out of jail... He then goes and he finds, as you said, 19-year-old Charles Steele at the unemployment office, and he offers him $2 for him to work for 15 or 20 minutes. Now, if Oswald is a dedicated uh, Marxist and he's trying to uh, you know, work to promote people to have well, the wait, same there, There's one more point I think you should have added. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What kind of a communist calls the FBI of to course. be interviewed? Right. Okay. Why After did he these arrests, <laughs> I mean, and an why informant. did the interview last an hour long? Right. Why, you know. Okay. I mean, and by the way, that's conservative. There's some people who say it lasted even longer than that. Okay. Right. So, so that's another very interesting thing. And then, right. as as you note, he then goes to the ITM. Okay, the inter Clay Shaw's uh, International Trademark. All right. And he does so, and he pays a guy, Mr. Steele, okay, to help him leaflet. And then he gets all this coverage. See, this is what's mm -hmm. so bizarre about this is that here's this lonely communist who's supposed to not know anybody, who's supposed to be some kind of sociopath, but there's films of him there on Canal Street handing out these flyers. There's films of him outside the International Trade Mart. And just mm -hmm. by an enormous coincidence, the night of the Kennedy assassination, those films get injected into the mainstream media, right. supplying right. a motive for the assassination. Well, this is why he did it, because he was a, a, a communist. He was a sociopath. OK, look at this. Look at these films of him leafleting in, of all places, New Orleans. OK, just a right. coincidence. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's during this time that Oswald and Steele are handing out the flyers that uh, WDSU TV shows up. Oh, look at that. Isn't that surprising? The TV shows up right on cue, right when Oswald pays the guy to work for a short period of time. And by the way, this whole thing about him working for you know $2 for 15 or 20 minutes of work, that's from Steele. 
steel told the hsca that right. but right. then when the hsca asked him if he knew uh, if he was aware of oswald before that he refused to answer the question <laughs> i mean he should have taken the alan dulles uh you know uh, old line of uh just lie we're gonna we're gonna lie if you but instead he he goes I'm like, you can't answer that <laughs> okay now, it's kind of now, an answer <laughs> this is not the end of the story because sure. the real end of the story is the interviews that oswald then does yes okay with stucky with bringier with mm -hmm. butler and in the newspaper with David Chandler, and he actually called some guy in New York City. Okay, now why on earth he would do that is, is unbelievable. Okay, but see, this leaves a giant paper and film trail of right. all the things that he was doing there in the summer of 1963. Now, Stucky was calling the FBI office in 1962, asking them, is there any representative of Fair Play for Cuba committee here in, in New Orleans? Okay. Wow. All right. The year before this happened, Stucky is already revving up for this thing. Uh -huh. uh, there's evidence Oswald wrote a letter to the FPCC in 1962 from Dallas. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there are clear suggestions, okay, that this was not a kind of serendipity kind of event, sure. right. okay? All right, and so then he does two interviews with Oswald, okay? And the, and the second one, they're joined by Butler and Bringier, okay? And I think that's called Conversation Carte Blanche or something like that. Indeed. Yeah, okay, all right. And that, now again, the day after the assassination, Butler goes to Washington. The day after the assassination, Butler goes to Washington and he testifies before Thomas Dodd's committee. Okay, Thomas Dodd was a senator who hated JFK. Okay, and he ran the equivalent of the House on Americans uh, committee in the Senate. And Butler's up there within 24 hours, okay? This is all so interesting, okay? Because it's like Oswald was seeking out all this publicity. Yes. And if you consider it from his point of view, I'm not talking about the big picture, from his point of view, then this is all seems to be a part of an assignment to discredit mm -hmm the FPCC, which right. by the way, as Paul Blow has done, mm -hmm. uh, was on a downward spiral from 1962 to 1963, all right? right? And, and it was pretty much headed for extinction, all right? And this is what the Kennedy assassination did. It essentially put the flowers on the top of the grave Okay, mm -hmm. for the burial of the Fair Play for Cuba committee. Now, you can say that this is what Oswald thought he was doing, okay? Uh, being completely unaware that there was actually a larger picture frame, you know, around right. this, okay, yes. by the people who were manipulating him. Okay, you know, in in New Orleans, Dallas, Washington, and Mexico City. When when I uh, when I as I was reading this, the picture that came to mind was like the Truman Show. So you know, in the Truman Show, uh, the, the main character, Jim Carrey's character, doesn't know that everything's fake and everyone's an actor that's interacting with him. Right? He's just like you know, at first, he eventually learns it. Right? But it just was wild to me how many people were either FBI or, or CIA tied that were directly involved in this. So you've got, you know, FBI informants, Jesse Corr, Carlos Bringuer, Charles Steele, Miguel Cruz, who's one of Bringuer's friends who helped, uh, you know, go go talk to Oswald, Bill Stuckey, the radio host, Orvi Ockoin, the cameraman, 
Uh, and then CIA assets, you got uh, Kelso Hernandez, who knocked the flyers out of Oswald's hands, and Ed Butler, who was getting CIA money for Inca. So, and just, Bartez. Just, just one little- Bartez was one of the guys who showed up in court. Okay. okay. Uh, he was bringing the air's buddy. Okay. He was a CIA asset also. CIA. All right. So, there's another one. Yeah. I mean, how that seems implausible. That seems like. It just doesn't seem there could be that many. And like you said, it's already on the WDSU agenda for the day. Bottom line, the point of Oswald handing out these these fears and going on TV, like you said, was for him to, you know, to have this damning material ready to go when you add it to the backyard photos and the Walker story. Hey. That's really easy for people to understand. I look at this guy handing out flyers of this crazy ideology. I went, one last question, Jim. And again, thanks for uh, being with us today. Do you think that, and this is, I guess I'm asking you to speculate here, but do, do you think that this operation of, of Oswald basically being sheep dipped uh, through Bannister's office, handing these flyers out, being filmed, um, it, is, is that like definitely tied to the JFK assassination at the time it's happening? Uh, like, in other words, is that being done specifically to make him the patsy? Or is it possible that there's some other purpose that they were going to use him for, and it was just uh, FPCC? I mean, I guess we don't really know for sure if the decision had been made at that time, or uh, I, do, you, do you kind of follow my question as? Well, ultimately, that's unanswerable. You, you can't really okay. say one way or the other. Um, but I, 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 I will say this, that Oswald was one of three people, they were at least three people that they were setting up in 1963. Uh, the other ones being Valet in Chicago and Gilberto Lopez down in Tampa. All right. I've come to the conclusion mm -hmm. by studying this stuff, the Chicago, the Tampa and the New Orleans thing, that one way or another, Kennedy was not getting out of 1963 alive okay, that they were going to get them, you know, at one of these three destinations. So ultimately, to answer your question, I would, and again, we can't say for sure, but I would come down on the side that it more likely was than it was not. You know, that's what they call, what is that, the uh, preponderance of the evidence in the yes, legal sphere? Yes. Uh -huh. More likely than not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's something. Because what's crazy is there's so many people involved in New Orleans, so many FBI informants and CIA. I wonder if if the similar sheep dipping was occurring with Valley and Lopez. We just don't have maybe as much information about that. I guess because right because they done. they weren't anywhere no near to. investigated enough. You know, if you can believe it, the right. Warren Commission more or less just didn't do anything you know uh, well that's not surprising okay but uh, but they more or less didn't do anything about that yeah yeah well um any any parting thoughts on uh on any of this stuff no i i think we more or less covered the waterfront okay on 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 this issue thanks again jen it was great to have you on the show Next time on Solving JFK, we look at the recap and rebuttals for episodes 50 to 52 with Jeff Crudell, host of JFK, The Enduring Secret. After that, we'll be taking a week off before turning our attention to Mexico City.